Okay, so this afternoon I'm having a chat with Arin Molosov, uh, who has set up a non profit organization called UK UA Together. Um, Arin, so you're from the Ukraine, um, so it's obviously very important to you this. Can you tell us a bit about this humanitarian uh, initiative you set up to help the Ukrainian refugees? Uh, so thank you for having me on, Panda. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk about UK UA uh, together. No uh, so, <laughs> so, um, so. Uh, there's about 12 of us or so volunteers that are active in UA, UA together. I was born in uh, Odessa in the Ukraine and we left when I was young. But to be honest, the ethos of the charity has very little to do with me and my personal story, although obviously there are connections. But for all of us volunteers, I think... Uh, you know the context of what's happening you know the europe hasn't seen this for 70 80 years this sort of level of conflict really spoke to us and it motivated to set up uk ua together and uh, what these what our non-profit organization does which is uh, national so I'm based in the Cotswolds and we have put a lot of people in the Cotswolds, but it is national, is we focus on getting vulnerable people from the Ukraine who are seeking safety and seeking shelter away from the rockets and the bombs. And we are focused on finding them hosts, matches um, in the UK under the Homes for Ukraine scheme. So that's the biggest objective and the primary objective of what we do. And of course, the secondary objective is once they get here, we support them with post-arrival aspects, um, including microfinancing to get them up on their feet as quickly as possible. Um, and so at what stage is this organisation sort of currently at? It's so new, isn't it? It's quite new, yes. I mean, the war is quite new. So yeah. we, uh, we've been active for four months. And the, our site allows hosts to register if they want to sponsor people. And it allows Ukrainian families to register if they're looking to come into the UK. And what we do is we try and find the right family for each other. And where it is, it's uh, the number of Ukrainian families registered is just astronomical. We've got almost 2,000, 2,500 families registered. Wow. And individuals that's families and a family could have anywhere between five and one person uh including you know someone with pets yeah. right yeah. dogs which we've also gotten in so uh it allows ukrainian families to register uh it allows hosts to register so where we are is we've done close to 220 visas nice. um about 150 of those people have entered the uk and um, we have supported close to 160 host families to welcome the Ukrainian families into the UK. How fantastic. And, and so far, um, uh, how have you gone about uh, gaining um, the, you know, the hosts? So it's been, a lot of it has been word of mouth. We have got an excellent website and things like that tend to go viral. So, yeah. you know, one host has a very good experience hosting a family so they tell someone else and they tell someone else and so on and so forth we've had uh, some media attention we've had a bbc south interview we've had some sort of local rags we haven't really relied on social media at this stage at all because we haven't needed to and we are doing a lot with the local um councils yes to try and, and work with them to access some of their hosts that they're holding as well. So that's that's what we have done to date, and it's been quite successful. Wow, that's amazing. Um, and uh, and and how do the funds actually support the uh, refugees? What does it sort of all go towards? Is it bringing them over? Is it's the sort of cost of travel? Sort of how far does it? How far does that reach? So it's a really good question. So we, we're after two things. One is obviously hosts 
and the other is funds. And your question about what are the, the funds used for, it's three things primarily. One is to the refugees on their journey from, uh, from Ukraine onto the UK. So, uh, for example, we recently got uh, a mum and her 14-year-old son out of occupied territory in Kherson, yeah. and we helped them um, fund the hotel in Poland. We bought them tickets to come over here. We uh, gave them some funds while they were in Poland so they could survive and eat, etc. So the first one is that kind of pre-arrival. Yes, yes. Um, the second is that immediate, some families have sponsors who can afford a little bit more, some have sponsors who can afford a little bit less. So yeah. the second of that on the ground support straight away, it could be um, food and hygiene products, it, would, it could be some cash so they can go and buy the newborn baby, I don't know, bassinet, what have you. Yes. And then the third and the most important is this microfinancing, which is um, an aspect and a service we're very proud of. So this is about the us as a charity and also the host and the Ukrainian families having, I guess, joint accountability. And it's about giving people a hand up as opposed to a handout. So how that works is, if say we place a family in the countryside yeah. where the houses tend to be so there's more room uh we place a family there but they need a car to get anywhere as yeah. you know a country you can't survive yeah. without no you can't really you can't you can't access jobs so if they uh say start working or they have a little bit of cash and let's say they save up a thousand pounds then what we do is we grant them you know a third if a car okay. Thousand, so they might save up a thousand. We might grant them five hundred pounds, and we might loan them five hundred pounds at zero interest. And um, all the Ukrainian families adore the aspect of the loan as well as the grant, obviously, because they don't want handouts. They really don't want handouts. You know, all these people who have come over, Panda, they're just like you and me. They're people. They're educated. You know, most of them had beautiful lives. You know, they've worked hard. They invested all their money in their properties. A lot of those properties have been shelled, gone, yeah. cars ruined. So they know how to work hard and they want to, as quickly as possible, get settled, start again. And I would say that two thirds will probably end up staying and maybe a third will end up going back. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so what is the... Um, the pro i mean there are obviously three things you're looking for the microfinancing yeah. the hosts and what was the other thing uh, and the well just the funds uh, well uh, so we're looking for hosts and we're looking um for funds to support the families yes. that we bring in yeah. them integrate as quickly as possible into yeah. the community um and and how do you sort of um assess the suitability of um hosts i mean is it quite a rigorous sort of process for the potential hosts how easy is it for them to you know register get themselves sorted out so they're you know available and accepted as being hosts so we um one of the reasons we started the charities we saw that once the uk government created this homes for ukraine scheme there were lots of desperate people going on facebook and finding what i would call some of them are unsuitable matches mm. like we don't think in our own organization that it's suitable to place a single young woman with a single young man no you know, for better or worse, that is just not something that is our protocol. No. So part of the reason we set up the organization is to make sure that the Ukrainian families get vetted and also the hosts get vetted. And how we do the vetting is through um, video interviews. Yeah. Uh, asking for references. So every family that we've placed refugees in, we've got character references, we've done video interviews. Yeah. And we do three or four way interviews when we actually do the matches. So we are there 
every single way. Yeah. Um, the one of the services that we offer and why I think, you know, we've been successful to date is we actually take it upon ourselves to do the visas. I mean, the visa process is very, very difficult. I think, um, you know, if you were to do it from hours and we have a group of people, of volunteers who are on the visa side and they take all the documents and they just sort it out for you. I would say our process is extremely rigorous and in the context where people can just randomly match themselves it's beyond anything i've seen on the market and i think is why i would say out of all the matches that we've done um all but one has worked yeah. right all but one that's and that's pretty good yeah that's amazing it's fantastic um, and um, Irene, can you um, give me an example of, of any um, particular families that, that you've helped um, so far? Yes, absolutely. I mean, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, but a typical story is um, there's a lady, she's one of the first ones we got in. Um, her name is Yuda. She put her two children, Max, in the car and uh she's from nikolaev and when you know the rockets and the bomb started she just drove her oh. husband stayed behind because obviously most men can't get out unless oh. they're in and she just drove and drove until she ended up in france and then she registered with us uh one of the early registrations and we found her a sponsor pretty quickly uh her name is sarah Nia whitney actually okay chair and how we helped her is while she was staying in france uh with volunteers we did so much we obviously did the visa process for her um the visas got stuck we escalated things with the local mp for whitney yeah. um, it was really early days there were no plans there was no protocol for pets to get in so we contacted the local charities we escalated it all the way up because she was actually going to put the cat, you know, on the truck to head back to Ukraine to her husband. Oh, no. Awful. It was just awful. You, you know, we all have family pets, right? It's of course, yes. Very close to our hearts. Very close to the heart. So we helped her with everything. We, we, we did the visas. We did the process. Uh, we also supported the host. Let's not forget, you know, we advised the host, which is, you know, a lot of what we do how to register for the school for the kids, um, you know, what to do upon arrival, how do you get your biometrics, how do you get your universal credit? So we took care of the host, advised the host on what to do, you know, we did card for the phone. And then upon, upon her arriving uh, to the UK, uh, we met her with donations, uh, we included her in our Tuesday morning, where we've got a hub in the Cotswolds coffee mornings, uh, we put her in touch with other Ukrainians, I included her in the chat with other people, um, we advised, we're just there for her, you know, as a backbone, and the best thing of all, we could help her with a job. Fantastic. So we directly helped her get a job. So as it stands, Yula now is in employment. The kids are both at school. Um, the cat is happy. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. the, and the host is delighted that um, it's been such a good match. So it's really, you know, I've got lots of stories like that. And the main thing is they're in safety. That's, yeah, exactly. That is the main thing. Um, and uh, And so how do you do you sort of um how do you prepare the hosts before the arrival i mean do you, i suppose you go through everything with them what they'll need to do how they're going to need to do it etc cetera, etc cetera. we do it's probably it's, quite a daunting you know it's a daunting thing isn't it i suppose I, for them a really big thing i think you know yeah. people have been i mean i've been astounded uh to the extent that people have opened up their hearts in their homes and those who haven't have supported and donated through various means yes you know? um and for the ones who do open up their homes it is it there, there is a lot of work i mean it is yeah. quite um so we have a post arrival guide on our website that lists everything that you need to do. So, you know, how to get the free SIM card for your Ukrainian family, 
uh, which banks are looking after the Ukrainian refugees the best, yes. to, how to access schools, what happens when the council comes and visits and brings certain money, et cetera. So we, we've got everything on our website, like a step-by-step -step guide. Yes. I also run webinars, what to expect when you're expecting. Okay. And that, and you know, you know that's available online, and you know we will do more. Um, we're also we're also there for the host. They know, you know, they know us because they've been through the whole process with us. So we do enormous amount of hand holding, and we're there for them. It's very it's very high contact. I'm sure. I'm sure. And um, so, can you just uh, tell me in simple terms how members, um, you know, who are listening to this. Um, Go, if they want to get the process started in you know deciding they would like to host a family yeah what's the first thing what do they need to do to get the ball rolling just register as a host on uk together.org yeah Literally, as soon as they register they'll get a call um from the head of our hosts you know side and um she'll call and she'll have a chat and we will try and understand who is it that you can you know bring into your house is it a lady with a child over the age of 12 can you take a couple can you take a cat i mean we have currently as i said you know close to two and a half thousand families so whoever you need i'm sure will be yes. sad sadly in a position to find someone for you who needs support. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much for talking to me today. And um, I very much hope that we can encourage members of Grapevine to um, consider hosting a family. Amazing. Panda, thank you so much for having me. It was really lovely to speak Not to you. Not at all. Thank you very much for chatting. Okay, speak to you soon.